I refuse to stand around and wait for someone else to do what God has called me to do. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace and peace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. And with your spirit. As we gather together this day to give God thanks and to give God praise, we are ever mindful of God's infinite love and his infinite mercy. And we dare to say, Lord Jesus, you are the source of all life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ Jesus, you forgive us when we sin. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you promise us eternal life with the Father. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins and bring us everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, increase our faith, hope, and charity, and make us love what you command, so that we may merit what you promise. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. Thus says the Lord, you shall not molest or oppress an alien, for you were once aliens yourselves in the land of Egypt. You shall not wrong any widow or orphan. If ever you wrong them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. My wrath will flare up and I will kill you with the sword. Then your own wives will be widows and your children orphans. If you lend money to one of your poor neighbors among my people, you shall not act like an extortioner toward him by demanding interest from him. If you take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, you shall return it to him before sunset. For this cloak of his is the only covering he has for his body. What else has he to sleep in? If he cries out to me, I will hear him, for I am compassionate." The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
a reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Brothers and sisters, you know what sort of people we were among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, receiving the word in great affliction with joy from the Holy Spirit, so that you became a model for all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and in Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves openly declare about us what sort of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols, to serve the living and true God, and to await his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the coming wrath. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a scholar of the law, tested him by asking, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. The Gospel of the Lord. It is good to be back here with you once again. Last week I was away on retreat and I was at Camp San Pedro. And if you read the bulletin, you'll see that we got two new pieces of art for our foyer and our baptistry because they weren't using them. And I said, gee, I'll store them for you. And they said, well, you can have them. So anyway, we have the pictures of the two items uh, in our bulletin and come to church and check them out. It's really nice. But anyway, it's very good to be back with you. I'm glad Father Roos was here last week. It's always a pleasure to hear him and to be with him. And so today we are continuing in Matthew's gospel, and we are still in that same section between the fourth discourse and the fifth discourse. Last week, you may recall that um, Jesus was asked this question, do we pay our taxes or not pay our taxes? And you see, It seems as though we humans tend to want to create black and white reality. We want to create this false sense of either one or the other. And that's just not reality. As you know, reality is not black or white. I think birds, some birds are black and some birds are white. But other than that, nothing is black or white. Everything has color. And so we tend to, though, as humans, want to do this false polemic that it's one way or the other way. 
And that's exactly what last week the Pharisees did to Jesus. It's what happens over and over when they try to trap Jesus. They, they present him with these false dynamics. And so, you know, we hear the, the woman caught in adultery. Well, either adultery is okay or we stone her to death. It's one or the other. Either we give up our identity and pay our taxes or we have a rebellion and not pay our taxes. Which is it? Is it one or the other? Jesus says with the adulterous woman, let you without sin cast the first stone. Jesus in Matthew's gospel says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. And so he doesn't buy into that false dynamic of polarity approach to reality because it's not reality. We are faced with those False polemics today. Either you are for the country and you take a stand for the national anthem, or you're for racial justice and you take a knee. It's one or the other. We have polemics all around us. Either you're for open borders or for no immigration at all. One or the other, black or white. Either you stand for life or you stand for death. One or the other. Pope Francis, in his um, Rejoice and Be Glad apostolic exhortation, says it this way. The other harmful ideological error is found in those who find suspect the social engagement of others, seeing it as superficial, worldly, secular, materialistic, communist, or populist. Or they relativize it as if there are other more important matters, or the only thing that counts is one particular ethical issue or cause that they themselves defend. Our defense of the innocent unborn, for example, needs to be clear, firm, and passionate, for at stake is the dignity of a human life, which is always sacred and demands love for each person, regardless of his or her stage of development. Equally sacred, however, are the lives of the poor, those already born, the destitute, the abandoned, and the underprivileged the vulnerable, infirm, and elderly exposed to covert euthanasia, the victims of human trafficking, new forms of slavery, and every form of rejection. We cannot uphold an ideal of holiness that would ignore injustice in a world where some revel, spend with abandon, and live only for the latest consumer goods, even as others look on from afar, living their entire lives in abject poverty. You see, it's not one or the other. How many times in Facebook do I see a post that'll say, well, do we help a veteran or do we help a refugee? One or the other. You see, these false dynamics separate as opposed to reality, which is always somewhere in between. And yet those false sense is what's really hurting us as a people. In today's gospel, Jesus offers a third way. He offers a third way that says, it's the way of love. That's the third way. You know, this week we've heard, uh, I, I don't know what, what the Pope said, that you know, civil unions is a necessity to protect people under the law. You see, it's not black or white. Are you for or against? It's that people need protection under the law. And so today is Thursday. I don't know what's going to come out officially by tomorrow, but recognizing it's not black or white is the key. And so today we hear this basically very simple story where this 
scholar of the law. Remember what the law is. The law isn't like, you know, the Constitution. The law is the Torah. The law is the Bible. The law is the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. And so a scholar of the law, this guy's a biblical scholar. He knows the Bible and wants to set up this polemic with Jesus. Which law? They had over 600 laws. Which law is the most important? Jesus doesn't give in to that. And so Jesus really gives the principle of all law. He quotes to them the Shema. Now, we all here know what the Shema is. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. You see, Jewish people knew that. They prayed it three times a day. They put it on their wrists, on their foreheads, in the mezuzah, on their front door. They had these words, not as good luck, but as a reminder of the principle of all law. The principle of all their behavior is about love. Now, when we hear Matthew give this, he says it's love God and equally. Just like Pope Francis said, it's not abortion or migration. It's not one or the other. It's love of God and love of neighbor. On those two, the entire law and prophets are based. It's the essence. Now, we're mindful that in Matthew's gospel, Jesus comes not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And that's what we hear today, what that fulfillment of the law is. It's that undergirding principle of love of God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Mm, people's minds these days. And love your neighbor as yourself. Those of you who are not Daytona residents or area residents, at Lourdes we have our tagline, loving the God we cannot see by loving the neighbor we can. You see, that's our mission. That's how we embody the principle that we hear today. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. The way we love the God we cannot see is by loving the neighbor we can. It makes no sense to say, I love God and don't care about my neighbor. That's just crazy. That's not what it's about. It's about the two going together hand in hand. And we know at Our Lady of Lords we've had to say, well, what does it mean to love? And rather simply, what it means to love is to willing the good of the other and the most important part, acting on it. It's one thing to say, well, I love you. You know, keep warm, well fed, have a nice day, bye. But rather, we have to act on it. Now, last Tuesday night at um, our... Actually, Monday night, my days are all messed up. On Monday night at our community problems assembly, the minister who gave Why We're Here Reflection quoted Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., which I thought was very appropriate. She quoted, One of the greatest problems of history is that the concepts of love and power are usually contrasted as polar opposites. Love is identified with a resignation of power and power with a denial of love. What is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive, and that love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. Justice at its best is love correcting everything that stands against love. Power is nothing more or nothing less than the ability to act. As we say, love is willing the good of the other and acting on it. And it says that the ability to act without love is reckless. It's reckless and abusive. And loving without action is anemic and sentimental. And so the two go hand in hand and they go together. 
And that's why we are called to act. Now, our first reading today is always chosen to go with the gospel. And one would have thought that the first reading would have been maybe the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, love God with all. But that's not what the church chose. The church chose this reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah about how we treat immigrants, how we treat strangers. And so in a sense, the church chose this first reading because it asks us, how do we love the other? And in Isaiah, the reading is rather strong because it says, you know, don't forget that you were once aliens yourself. I am second generation Italian. My parents were born here, but my grandparents were born in Italy. And it always amazes me that I have cousins, you know, second generation Americans who forgot that my grandfather, Grandpa Frank, was called to be in Mussolini's army, <laughs> to go back to Italy and fight against us. Well, my grandmother stayed here with her eight kids. And yet my cousins are like anti-immigration. They're like, you know, well, we came when it was easy to come, and we're glad we're here, and oh, well, we don't want anybody else coming for a better life. We got the better life. And I, I want to shake them and say, what is wrong with you? How dare you forget that we were once aliens ourselves? And trust me, they didn't like us. My poor grandparents, you know, they didn't speak English. They didn't like, my grandmother, until she died, didn't, you know, spoke broken English. But, you know, they thought Italians were dirty, smelly people. And we did have our share of issues. But we were welcomed. And so we hear this first reading, and it doesn't go well. If you, if you listened closely to that first reading, it basically says if you do not welcome the, if you forget your roots and do not welcome the immigrant, I will hear them, and I will make you widows, your wives widows, and your children orphan. And so it's rather harsh because I'm sure people back then are like people today. Now, in the Pope's uh, recent encyclical, which I think is, you know, today we get your notebooks out. It's called Fratelli Tutte, Brothers and Sisters All, okay? That we're all brothers and sisters. He deals rather directly with this issue, which I think is important for us to hear what he says. He says, then too, in some host countries, migration causes fear and alarm, often fomented and exploited for political purposes. You think? This can lead to a xenophobic mentality as people close in on themselves, and it needs to be addressed. Migrants are not seen as entitled like others to participate in the life of society, and it is forgotten that they possess the same intrinsic dignity as any person. No one will ever openly deny that they are human beings, yet in practice by our decisions and the way we treat them, we can show that we consider them less worthy, less important, less human. For Christians, this way of thinking and acting is unacceptable since it sets certain political preferences above deep convictions of our faith the inalienable dignity of each person, regardless of origin, race, or religion, and the supreme law of fraternal love. He goes on. Migration, more than ever before, will play a pivotal role in the future of our world. At present, however, migration is affected by the loss of that sense of responsibility for our brothers and sisters on which every civil society is based. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes. I realize that some people are hesitant and fearful with regard to migrants. I consider this part of our natural instinct of self-defense. Yet it is also true that an individual and a people are only fruitful and productive 
if they are able to develop a creative openness to others. I ask everyone to move beyond those primal reactions because there is a problem when doubts and fears condition our way of thinking and acting to the point of making us intolerant, closed, and perhaps even without realizing it, racist. In this way, fear deprives us of the desire and the ability to encounter the other. And so Pope Francis, in his latest encyclical that came out, makes it rather clear where we stand as Christians. There is no really debate for us. Now, it's one thing to set out these vague principles of love, but Pope Francis actually, in one of his um, world days of migration, gave us four key words that he says, practically speaking, needs to be the way we deal with people who are foreign to us. He says the four words are welcoming, protecting, promoting, and integrating. Okay? There is going to be a test. Take notes. Okay. Welcoming means, above all, offering broader options for migrants and refugees to enter destination countries safely and legally. This calls for a concrete commitment to increase and simplify the process for granting humanitarian visas and for reunifying families. I heard this week there are still 545 children who have not been unified with their families. The principle of the centrality of the human person firmly stated my, by my beloved predecessor, Benedict XVI, obliges us to always prioritize personal safety over national security. Wow. Radical words. Radical words. Does that mean we don't send people back to Mexico? causing them to live in extremely horrible, unsafe conditions? Second verb, protecting, may be understood as a series of steps intended to defend the rights and the dignity of migrants and refugees, independent of their legal status. Oh, I love that one. Either you're legal or you're not. Either you're documented or not. Black or white all these divisive polemics that we're faced with. Such protection begins in the country of origin, must be ongoing as far as possible in the country of migration, guaranteeing them adequate consul consular assistance, the right to personally retain their identity documents at all times, and fair access to justice. Promoting. Promoting essentially means a determined effort, you know, it's all about intention, a determined effort to ensure that all migrants and refugees, as well as the communities which welcome them, are empowered to achieve their potential as human beings in all the dimensions which constitute the humanity intended by the Creator. The final verb, integrating concerns the opportunities for intercultural enrichment brought about the presence of migrants and refugees. Integration is not an assimilation that leads migrants to suppress or to forget their own cultural identity. That's what my ancestors were asked to do. We were part of a melting pot. Let go. You're not Italian anymore. You're American now. No Italian language. No Italian culture, although we still eat our pasta every Sunday. But it wasn't about integration. It was about assimilation. <clears throat> this is a lengthy process that aims to shape societies and cultures, making them more and more a reflection of the multifaceted gifts of God to human beings. To welcome aliens is to welcome God. Today's gospel 
and first reading remind us very powerfully of who we are to be. And not so much the laws that are important, but the undermining principle of all law. And all law is about loving God with our whole heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind, and loving our neighbor. If there's a law that says I can leave my homeless brother or sister on the street, then we don't follow that law. If there are laws that say we do not welcome people who are seeking asylum, we don't follow that law because we follow the law of love. It's the third way. It's not black and it's not white. It's the third way. It's the way of love. Today's gospel takes the polemic, give to Caesar what is Caesar. Do we pay our taxes? Do we lose our identity? We have the third way today. It's the way of love, willing the good of the other and acting on it. Let us profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray to our Father in heaven who hears the cry of the poor. For all who are seeking asylum at our borders and 545 children still separated from their parents, that we will have the courage to welcome, protect, promote, and integrate them into our communities, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer that the work of the faith organization bear fruit in developing solutions for affordable housing, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who are marginalized through poverty, food insecurity, lack of shelter, and those who are imprisoned, and that the actions of Christians everywhere will bring them help and hope, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. During this time of civil elections, that we citizens may vote wisely and seek the common good, protect the vulnerable, serve the good of all, and work toward unity rather than division, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who are suffering from COVID-19 and all who are sick and suffering, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For the over 222,000 U.S. citizens who have died from COVID-19, for Maria Jankowskis, Gallo Pineda, Gerard Quinn, Barbara Walters, and all who have died, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you with these our needs through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that this my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, our Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. 
Look, we pray, O Lord, on the offerings we make to your majesty, that whatever is done by us in your service may be directed above all to your glory. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For in you we live and move and have our being. And while in this body we not only experience the daily effects of your care, but even now possess the pledge of life eternal. For having received the first fruits of the Spirit, through whom you raised up Jesus from the dead, we hope for an everlasting share in the Paschal mystery. So with all the angels, we praise you. As in joyful celebration, we acclaim. are indeed holy, and to be glorified, O God, who love the human race and who always walk with us on the journey of life. Blessed indeed is your Son, present in our midst when we are gathered by his love, and when, as once for the disciples, so now for us, he opens the scriptures and breaks the bread. Therefore, Father most merciful, we ask that you send forth your Holy Spirit to sanctify these gifts of bread and wine that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day, day before he was to suffer, on the night of the Last Supper, he took bread and said the blessing, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, gave you thanks, gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The Mystery of Faith. Therefore, Holy Father, as we celebrate the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Savior, whom you led through his passion and death on the cross to the glory of the resurrection, and whom you have seated at your right hand, we proclaim the work of your love until he comes again, and we offer you the bread of life and the chalice of blessing. Look with favor on the oblation of your church, in which we show forth the paschal sacrifice of Christ that has been handed on to us. And grant that by the power of the Spirit of your love, we may be counted now and until the day of eternity among the members of your Son, in whose body and blood we have communion. Bring your church, O Lord, to perfect faith and charity, together with Francis, our Pope, John, our Bishop, with all bishops, priests, and deacons, 
and the entire people you have made your own. Open our eyes to the needs of our brothers and sisters. Inspire in us words and actions to comfort those who labor and are burdened. Make us serve them truly. After the example of Christ and at his command, and may your church stand as a living witness to truth and freedom, to peace and justice, that all people may be raised to a new hope. Remember our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the peace of your Christ and all the dead whose faith you alone have known. Admit them to rejoice in the light of your face and in the resurrection give them the fullness of life. Grant also to us when our earthly pilgrimage is done that we may come to an eternal dwelling place and live with you forever. There in communion with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with the apostles and martyrs, and with all the saints, we shall praise and exalt you through Jesus Christ, your Son. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil and graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace, I leave you my peace, I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will. We live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. May your sacraments, O Lord, we pray, perfect in us what lies within them, that what we now celebrate in signs we may one day possess in truth. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Just a reminder that we are collecting for the Pregnancy Crisis Center. You can drop off items in the church foyer if you come this weekend at Mass, or you can just bring it by the parish office during the week. Halifax Urban Ministries continues to make over 2,000 boxes and bags of food for the hungry in our community. Um, if you'd like to help with that, it's Tuesdays from 1 till 4 p.m. in the Ocean Center. This Wednesday, our drum circle will be meeting under the pavilion. That's Wednesday, October 28th at 6 p.m. Uh, please wear your masks, but we do arrange for uh, social distancing. If you are not receiving emails from us, please um, go online and or call the parish office so that we can get your information. We really would like everyone to receive uh, information from the parish, especially when, you know, we get the go-ahead, not now, but when we get the go-ahead for everybody to start coming back, we can email uh, that. Right now, I think we're beginning the second wave, and so I'm grateful that you're staying home, watching us online, and uh, being safe. And I think the CDC came out yesterday saying that, you know, it's 15 minutes in a 24-hour period of breathing in someone else's virus. So be safe, wear masks, stay home as much as possible, and uh, that's certainly the key. So we continue to worship in this way. I once again thank all of you for your continued support of our parish. Uh, it is through your generosity we are able to make ends meet. Um, so thank you. Thank you very, very much. It's it's greatly needed and greatly appreciated, as I always say. Um, okay, I think, oh, All Souls Day is, uh, we're going to celebrate on Saturday, I think November 7th, after the uh, 4 o'clock Mass. We'll be at the Grotto, weather permitting. If not, we'll move it into the church, but I want people to be outside so they can feel safe and attend. So, you know, having social distance and outside is Florida. We're, we're good to go, so that's what we're planning. We're also planning a virtual Thanksgiving service like we did the National Day of Prayer. We're not going to have anything in the church, but rather we will do it uh, virtually online. So be prepared for that, as well as Cities for Life. We're planning to do that online as well. I'm going to ask Rachel to put the two documents I quoted from, uh, Fratate Tutti, all our brothers and sisters, and the Pope's message on... Uh, World Migration Day in 2018. So we'll have those documents. So if you'd like to read the entire documents, I highly recommend it. I think uh, Fratelli Tutte, it's not that long. Uh, it's definitely worth reading to, to understand what we as Catholics are, are believing in the world today because we have a living faith and we have to be aware. And I, I do think um, those documents will help us if we are preparing to be uh, vote and to have, to, you know, informed consciences about what our church teaches, especially having to do with the, the balance and uh, understanding all the important issues together. My brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. And May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God. What hope we have, even in the longest night, for the light will overcome. We will not Honey.